bow our heads of prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for all that you continue to do for us and for your guidance. You continue to provide for us in our lives. We recognize, dear Lord, that without you, we can do nothing. And as we study your word today, we pray that you will reveal yourself to us and draw us ever closer to you. So I pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So let's go to our screens. And um, let's plow through, because we have a lot to cover today. And I really don't want to um, have to lose where we are. So today, if you will, we are going to cover uh, another context setting approach because as I approach the end of Revelation, I think it's important that we have a good sense, if you will, as to how we arrive at this point. All right. So we will spend some time reviewing the major symbols and headlines of chapters 12 to 19. I want to go back, you know, last week we spent some time spending a little look at how, um, if you will, how the, how, what the Bible had to say about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I think it's important to keep that in focus. So we will go back, taking a look at that, and then we jump into the millennium itself. And today's an introduction. So we will cover the first um, three verses of Revelation chapter 20. That is kind of where we will end up at the end of the day. And that hopefully will give us a very good, not hopefully, I expect it will give us a very good intro, awaken some interest within us, and we'll be ready for the second phase of this thing going forward. All right, so let's keep going. Um, in the review of the major symbols and headlines of chapters 12 to 19, you remember our, our layout map, if you will, which is our layout for how we are treating with this whole study of Revelation. And in looking at the book, we, we spent some time on the first half of the book, if you will, I mean, using the word half very loosely here because it's not a symmetrical half, but it's the first half of the book where we cover a lot of the historical aspects. And in particular, we focus on the um, Dark Ages period during 538 AD to 1798, right? So one of the things that is important to note is that <clears throat> in this first half of the book of Revelation, John continually rem reminds us that Jesus is coming again. As a matter of fact, Jesus' second coming is a recurring theme in the book of Revelation. And in the first half of the book, from the very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 7, we are told that Jesus will come again and every eye shall see him, including those that pierced him. And so as a reader, if you put yourself in that context, if you read that, you would say to yourself, wow, I'm going to now see what is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus. But John does not go to that just yet. He, he takes a step back and he gives us messages about the history of the churches, um, the seven churches, which is really the history of the Christian church throughout the ages in terms of the piousness and the sincerity of the church itself. And then we got into the end of the um, seven churches, and we concluded in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where he says, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hears, voice of him answer me, etc. And we again thought we we're going to get into the second coming of Jesus. But again, John sort of pulled back from that topic, and he went into the seven seals, and he talked about the fact that the, the, the external forces and the political nations will attempt to persecute the church and the church will go through various periods of persecution. And ultimately, that will culminate in, in the sixth seal. We talked about Christ coming there. Heavens, he partners a school, rocks and mountains falling upon the wicked people, etc. And again, we were introduced to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Silence in heaven for about half an hour, right? So we thought, well, right, this looks like a time now where we're really going to get into the second coming of Jesus. And then as we moved along, we went back again into history to the seven trumpets. And again, we got an insight into how the church itself would behave and how the church would become corrupted and how after, the seven, after 1798, the French Revolution, there would be a, a really outpouring of the work of the church 
and we would start to see the, the spreading of the gospel, etc. And we're going to get insights if the fact that the church is going to be wounded, the Christian church, the official woman church will be wounded, but that it will eventually rise again, right? So that was the, the seven trumpets. We were told about the great disappointment that will happen in 1844 in Revelation chapters 10 and 11, and then we were told to preach again. So that was the historical half. So we then came to Revelation chapter 12. And in Revelation chapter 12, we started now to get a sense, if you will, of some of the big things that is going to happen towards the end. And one of the very first things we encountered is that we concluded Revelation chapter 12 with an understanding that there would be a war on earth between the dragon, which is the devil, and the church, which is represented by a woman, if you will. And that is going to cause some havoc, all right? So, so we had that very important phrase that concluded chapter 12 that says, and the devil and the dragon was wrought with the woman. You all remember that well. And went to make war with the remnant of a seed. And we told who keep the commandments of God, etc. So that is important because it's important to remember that while the first half of the book gave us historical overview for us, that is, in John's time, it would have been forward-looking because he was living around 80, 90, 80, 100. But for us today, that is looking back. It's a review mirror where we are seeing what took place in the back, a review mirror, if you will. And we are seeing what took place historically. But now as we get to Revelation chapter 12, John is pointing to something that is even future to our time. And he's suggesting that going forward, there will be a real war between the, the dragon, which is the devil, and the woman, which is a remnant of a seed, the last day church of God, as we move towards Christ's second coming. So again, Christ's second coming is, is, is kind of predominant in this half of the book. But we are not getting to the actual details of when Christ comes. We are told about other things as we go forward. What are these other things we are being told about? Well, Revelation 12 talks about the woman, the child, the dragon, etc. And I could argue, if you will, in summary, that Revelation 12 introduced the war or reintroduced us to the war. Because in the Old Testament, we talked about the war between good and evil. And we talked about in Isaiah and Ezekiel about <clears throat> um, the devil wanting to be like God, etc., so Revelation 12 reintroduces this concept of the war, but it goes a little bit further than we have ever gone before because it tells us that the war started in heaven long before the earth was without form and void and before the earth was formed, and that the Lucifer was cast out and that he may have still had some opportunities to go back into heaven, which you remember from the book of Job. But by the time he had crucified Christ, or by the time Christ was crucified, let me say, um, the devil lost any opportunity. He was permanently cast down upon it. And in the remaining time that he has, he has focused his strategy on going after God's last day church. Is that all right? Because he has already lost the battle against Christ. And so who is now focused on, if you will, are the, um, the people who are Christ's followers. So in our, in our truth, in fact, you and I, we are carrying a heavy burden because we are representatives of Jesus Christ upon the earth. And sometimes it is good to remember that we are representatives of Jesus Christ. It kind of helps keep us humble because when you are tempted to think a lot about yourself, you need to remember that we are representatives of Jesus Christ upon the earth, right? So the devil is after us. And then we got to Revelation chapter 13, which then introduced a, a whole lot of um, different images, if you will. We saw a sea beast, we saw a land beast, a very, a very lamb-like beast. And I was thinking about that a little bit this weekend, and I was thinking that in, Reveille, in Daniel, we saw the metallic man in Daniel chapter 2. And then in Daniel chapter 7, the, the, the countries or the kingdoms of the world were introduced, if you will, as beast, lion and, and leopard with four heads and a bear lopsided and a beast that couldn't be... But in this Revelation chapter 13, a world kingdom is introduced as a lamb, docile, um, docile looking anyway, but certainly behaving 
with, with dragon-like qualities, all right? And we, 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 we sided with a lot of the historicist um, commentators who clearly have um, agreed and come to the conclusion that that lamb-like nation is the United States of America and will have an important role to play towards the end time. What is the role it will have to play? Well, it will, it will at some point in time um, unite with the religious leadership of the Roman church in the last ages and would create a, a union that will force worship according to the Christian beliefs of the Roman church. All right, and that is what we refer to as the image of the beast. And we say that one of its identifying marks, if you will, would be one something that was instituted by the Roman church that seems to have universal application. And we agree that that represented Sunday worship. All right? So, so in a way, you could argue that Revelation, keep this in mind, we're just doing a summary. Revelation 13 then introduced us to the dragon's team which is made up of a lamb-like beast and a sea beast, the Roman church, our, our, king, our country, or a nation, or a kingdom led by the Roman church, and a, a political nation that seems to be lamb-like initially, but becomes a dragon-like in its behaviors. And that those two will marry together with the other nations of the earth, and they would basically be united in a fight against God's people. You could very well see that Revelation 13 is a continuation of that theme from Revelation chapter 12, which is a theme that says the dragon is organized, united, if you will, to fight God's people. What Revelation 13 did was to expand on that and explain to us who are the main uh, members of the dragon's team. And that would be worldly, um, world nations and political systems united with the religious leadership of the Christian church. And they in turn would create a fight. It seems, it seems um, not strange because we've seen that before when during 538 to 1798, a similar um, union occurred and that resulted in, in people being persecuted, etc. Revelation 14 introduces us to the lamb victorious, we are told that Christ will be victorious. So again, the second coming of Christ is, 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 is um, introduced, if you will, but just to show the final victory. Christ in heaven, Mount Zion, the saints are wrong, 144,000, etc. But we haven't, we have, we still have no details as to what happens when he comes, right? Except for the general thing about rocks and mountains falling and heavens departing, etc. So that is still a detail that we need to get. But we are told about three angels, which we said represented God's people. We are told about Babylon and two harvests. So if you were to summarize chapter 14, it is really to say that while all this fight is going on upon the earth, God's reaction to that fight is to proclaim the gospel. Isn't that important? That while the world seems to want to fight God and his people and want to destroy them through violence, an economic sanction, God's response is to say to his people, don't pick up weapons and fight them back. No, proclaim the gospel. Let them know that there is a God who saves. Let them know there is a Jesus Christ who can save people from their sins. Let them know that I've started judgment already in 1844. Let them know that I will come in sometime in the future and they will either be on the side of the saved on the side of the loss, the harvest of the wheat or the harvest of the grapes. Are you appreciating that? There is a, <clears throat> there is a, a, a stark difference in the, in, the, in the strategy God has designed for his people versus the strategy of the opponent and the adversary. So the devil is attempting to destroy God's people, um, impose economic buy, no sell, etc., sanctions on people, etc., but what we find happening is that in God's case, he's saying, preach the everlasting gospel. Sister Gemma, you have a question. You can talk. If you're on mute, you can raise your, you can talk, Sister Gemma. I saw your hand went up. No? Hello? 
but that was by accident. All right, so we're not here now, but we will, um, so we'll move on, right? All right, so let's let's keep going. Um, maybe that hand went up in error. Right, so so what we find out is that that is up to Revelation 14. So let's keep going because we, we covered all this before. When we got to Revelation 15, we were told about the timing of the plagues and the temple, etc. And again, if I were to summarize that, I would say we are now introduced. So we still haven't arrived. You know, we've been really anxious to hear what happens when Christ comes? What are the events going to take place? But John is really taking his time. You think I do a lot of review? Look how much review John has been doing. So he then says to us, hold on, there's a section of time that I need to explain to you. What is that section of time? Well, it's when Jesus is finished with his heavenly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, and he gets up and he's complete with that. Between that time when it is finished and he's no longer being a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, and he actually comes, there would be a period where the earth is going to experience a significant amount of upheavals, overhaul, um, plagues, if you will. And that is a period that is introduced in Revelation chapter 15, using the imagery of the wilderness temple from the Old Testament times. Because we knew that when there is smoke fill the temple, the priests are not inside of there, and God's Shekinah glory is now about to enter into the temple. So it is a time when only God in his sovereignty is there, and the high priests, um, as ministers on behalf of God, they are not in the temple. So Revelation 15 says that a time is going to come like that in terms of the earth's timeline, and that the sanctuary being discussed is the heavenly sanctuary. You begin to appreciate why the heavenly sanctuary is so important as a biblical truth and a biblical understanding because you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot comprehend and clearly distinguish earth's final events without appreciating that Jesus is today in the heavenly sanctuary acting as our high priest and offering um, prayers and, and petitions and forgiveness on our behalf, all right? So, so Revelation 15 says, well, when he finishes that and he is over, which coincides, of course, with Daniel chapter 12, when it says, at that time shall Michael stand up. And if Jesus has become Michael, he is now a commander as opposed to a high priest. And he is, if he's standing up, it means he's finished his high priestly work, right? So the high priestly work is about to begin, it's coming to an end, sorry, but as it comes to an end, a period of plagues um, are ushered in, all right? So, so Revelation chapter 16 details the plagues for us. I won't go through that. We talked about um, signs in the sun, moon in the sun. We talked about frogs. We talked about Armageddon. We talked about all those various things. And by the way, um, someone had asked me about the tree frogs on YouTube, and I think I answered that. So I think we've covered that now about them almost being a representation of the three angels' message, a counterfeit representation that a dragon has in proclaiming his own message. So in Revelation chapter 16, we got details of the plagues. So we, we thought, well, we've covered everything now. Let's go to when Christ comes. But no, when we got to Revelation chapter 17, more details are given about, so it even goes back beyond the period of the place. And I think you need to appreciate that the chapters in Revelation, as in Daniel, are not necessarily given sequentially or chronologically. It's not, it's not a time chronology. It's not saying from a time perspective, this is what it is. Rather, rather, we are given a summary at the beginning, and then it goes back from succeeding chapters, if you will, and, and sort of magnifies and expands and, and clarifies certain aspects of what we saw before, just as we saw in Daniel chapter 2. So the same thing has happened in Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 17, it is almost a magnification of Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, we are told about the lamb-like beast and the sea beast. 
Well, Revelation 17 uses a different set of imagery. It talks about a woman who is a harlot, a prostitute, if you will, but it really means the sea beast. And it is using that, if you will, as a basis for discussing um, the details about this end time alliance. And as we begin to study this, some important truths come to us. One is, of course, that the woman um, is the mother of all churches, of all harlots, which suggests that she is not alone. The woman church is not alone, but that there would be a coming together, an ecumenical coming together of all the churches, if you will, and that they would be united with political forces. And when we talk political forces, Revelation 17 expands it to say it's not just America, but the kings of the earth, suggesting that there is a, a sort of worldwide coming together, of course, led by America. Um, and it creates this huge union that seeks to destroy God's people. All right. So Revelation 17, if you will, talks about end time battles and the bitter experiences of the believers because it, it gives us a little bit more detail about the battle of Armageddon and tells us that the final, this final union of church and state will come to the point where they would want to persecute and further um, destroy God's people. And then we got to Revelation 18 and 19. So 18 and 19, again, we thought we were going to go to the second coming of Jesus, but Revelation 18 and 19 carried us back a bit. Chapter 18 gave us a lot of um, the songs that we've seen in the Old Testament where God is reminding his people that this Babylonian system, this, this system that is filled with violence against God's people, it will not win. It will be destroyed. It will come to an end. This union will not succeed. And so he is, there are songs of victory, maybe lamentations, if you will, around Babylon, but there are songs of victory for the other side. And God is saying, you know, there's a, there's a, a verse in Revelation 13 that says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. There, there, there will be a tendency among God's people to want to fight fire with fire. You know, the people are coming after you with all this drama and you would say, well, why are we still just preaching gospel and praying? Or can we do something else? And God is saying, be patient. Just stay in your corner and do what you're supposed to do because at the end of the day, Babylon will fall. All right? And then he, just to, just to remind us about the value of being patient, he says, I will sup with you as a wedding supper on the lamb up in heaven. You know, I've invited you to be with me, you would be with me. And then he concludes by telling us that Babylon will come to an end. So, so Revelation 18 and 19, if you will, gives us a sense, of, a sense of how the battles end and that the war is almost over. All right, and I say almost because when we get to chapter 20, there are some details that we need to cover that will really signal the end of the war. So I hope everybody is kind of comfortable. So we came, if you will, to this overall sequence. Just before Christ comes, there will be the seven plagues. We'll have the sealing of those who are faithful to God, represented by 144,000 symbolically. And then there'll be a lot of events to enforce worship to the beast and his image, etc. And then we start to see the heavens departing as a scroll. They are really physical um, trauma in the world as Christ comes. But ultimately, we would be part of a great multitude who will be saved with him in the heavenly kingdom. God's people will be delivered. That's our, our big message. And then we, we, we took some key takeaways. Jesus is coming back to take those who have accepted the invitation to the wedding to heaven. John saw a typical representation of the second coming. A white horse, Jesus with bloodstained clothes, followed by angels, Riding horses, he's identified by two names, the word of God and the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus defeated Satan in heaven, at the, at the desert, and at the cross. He will now defeat him and his followers again, right? The symbolic meal, now Revelation chapter 19, talked about the birds of the air eating the flesh of those who were dead, right? It was symbolic, if you will. Um, and it is symbolizing the fact that the, the wicked people, the people who are, and I call them wicked, but the people who are not faithful to God and who have not chosen God, because throughout this part of Revelation from chapter 12, 
we are being reminded that there will be two classes of people at the end. Those who are followers of Christ, those who are followers of the beast and its image, all right? And the, the system of government. So that what we are being um, told about here is that towards the end, um, those people who are not faithful will die. So, so I want you to understand now that while we are heavily focused on the second coming here, let us also appreciate that earth is in a kind of drama state. It's, in, it's, it's desolate. It, it's, it's just gone through a series of mountains falling, rocks falling, fall upon us, volcanic activity, um, fire and brimstone looks like um, people are dying. Um, the, the, the brightness of Jesus is causing people to die, etc. So the earth is becoming a, a graveyard, if you will. Um, we will talk a little bit more about what happens to the, those who are faithful because we know that we've read that before that they will be caught up. As a matter of fact, Revelation 19 tells us that they will be taken up with Christ in heaven so that we are at a very critical point and we now need to move into Revelation chapter 20. Before we do that, however, I want us to just quickly cover some key um, takeaways from the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus is something that was portrayed since Daniel chapter 2. I mean, I mean, we know it's still from the Garden of Eden when God promised that the, um, the, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, the head of the serpent, and he will bruise his seed, right? But really, Daniel, when we looked at Daniel chapter 2 and we started this prophetic journey, we appreciated, if you will, that notwithstanding um, the fact that divided Europe or divided Rome, I know the, 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 the literature talks about divided Europe, but we should always remember that Rome, iron is still present in the feet and toes. So Rome is present up to the very, very end of the world, which is, of course, through the church, through the Roman church, right? So the church is, is present all the way to the end. And that's why I said religious political Rome is present from 476 all the way down to the present time, right? So it went through the Dark Ages period. It, it survived the French Revolution. And the church is now in its ascendancy again. And we know that it will reach the point where it becomes a dominant force in world affairs in the future. So we are at that point, if you will. And the only thing that needs to happen now is for Jesus to set up his kingdom. And so Daniel told us, yes, the stone will hit the image at his feet and will fill the whole earth, etc. And that will signal the second coming of God who will establish his everlasting kingdom. So, so we are at a point where um, as we deal with these end time events, which is really what we just looked at in Revelation um, 12 to 19, we covered a lot of end time events in this area. We really got an expansion on this area and a magnification of this area. And we understood a lot of great details here. What we are now to understand is that the only thing that seems to be outstanding is the ultimately the second coming of Christ. We know that there are other events that will take place in terms of the union of church and state becoming a real significant event. But ultimately, what we look for is the second coming of Christ and him establishing his everlasting kingdom. So the second advent, it is with Christ's second advent when the kingdoms of this world are destroyed. I want you to pay attention to that word, eh? that God sets up his kingdom of glory, a kingdom that will last forever. That's what Daniel told us in chapter 2. Then his people will begin their reign. So God is saying, look, I am painting you a picture of war upon this earth, a war that started in heaven, and now the theater of the war is earth itself, and you, followers of Jesus Christ, you are key actors in this war. You are key participants. How do you fight? Well, you fight by preaching the gospel, letting people know that I am here to save them, let them know that my judgment has started and I'm going to come a second time. And let them know that the oppressors will soon come to an end. That is our response. And just be faithful and patient. And it's hard for us to accept that. But ultimately, we are assured that Jesus will set up an everlasting kingdom. And in that kingdom, love will reign. 
in today's world, it seems as if violence and battle reigns and that who is stronger wins and who can hit the hardest wins. But in Jesus' world, those who are loved, those who are preaching his gospel, those who are patient, those who are whose, whose character is a I live, Paul says in Galatians 2.20, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That is what the ceiling of our character is and 144,000 means. It means that God's character comes within us. When that happens, without, without throwing a stone, without landing a punch, Christ comes, destroys the earthly governments who are and kingdoms who are bent on violence and, and forced to win and, and persecution to win their place. He destroys that. He establishes a new kingdom. And those of us who have chosen his way of love, we would live with him in that new kingdom forever and ever. That is, that is the summary of the message, if you will, going forward. So it's important to remember that, that Jesus, the main theme in Revelation is the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? That is something we've been, we've been talking about over and over again, and we talked about that last week. And then it's important to remember that Jesus will come again in person with glory and majesty, and that this is the event we are looking forward to, right? He will come on the clouds. Of course, we, we deconstructed this last week and said to you that when Revelation 19 talks about the many horses coming down, you can appreciate that whole cloud imagery as not necessarily floating clouds, but rather a retinue, a host, an army of angels who are accompanying Jesus coming forward, right? And so from a distance, it looks like a club. As it gets closer, you realize it's an army of angels, all right? Um, and we'll come back to this thing about those who will be resurrected and still alive. We'll see him at his coming, right? Um, and those who pay a similar also see it because we talked about that before. So Revelation did not stop. But even when we looked at um, the, the sixth plague in Revelation 6, 14 to 17, they talk about the second coming. Later on, when we were looking at Revelation 11, um, in those two chapters that we pair together, 10 and 11, we talked about the second coming of Jesus, right? So that has been a recurring theme. But there are other biblical references that I just want to remind you of today because it's important. So for the first time, maybe in our class, I will just quote some texts without getting into the context of those texts because it's important that you appreciate and you understand what we are trying to accomplish, right? So I just want to leave those texts with you. And if you take in your notes, or if you look at this sometime after in the YouTube, you can go back and read the context. But it's really, as we have always said, the Old Testament is the platform, the foundation for what is in Revelation. And so we are going through that at this point, right? So he says, Jeremiah gave us some very important predictions as he talked about what looked like the end of Israel, but he's really projecting to the end of time. He says, and on that day, the slain of the Lord, the slain of the Lord, right? So it means God has slain them, shall be from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. So he's painted a dismal picture here. He's suggesting that at some point, God will destroy um, those who are not part of him. No surprises there. We've been constantly um, being told about two classes of people, if you will. And then verse 33 continues and says, they shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. So he's really painting a sort of cryptic, prophetic picture of, of desolation, if you will. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man, meaning Christ, of course, shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and when then he will reward each according to his works. So Jesus has promised to come again with his angels, and he's also going to reward, which means that judgment will be executed based on the choices that we have made. The other thing is to note that Jesus is coming is glamorous. It is, it, is, it is very visual. It is not a secret. It is not something that happens and you didn't, you're not too sure he come until he hears any news. It is, will be very spectacular. So it says, for as a lightning coming from the east and flashes to the west, 
so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus is reminding us, if you will, in this famous, I told I was going to give you context, but I can do that now. In this famous sermon on the uh, mountain before he goes down into Jerusalem to be crucified, that, 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 that week, that few days before his crucifixion, in Matthew 24, he's saying, For as the lightning cometh from the east and flashes to the west, so, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus' is coming is going to be a spectacular event. Paul would later remind us, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So Paul is also reinforcing, if you will, this understanding that Christ's coming is very visible, it's a spectacular event, and it's accompanied by a resurrection, if you will. And he, he gives a criteria. He says the ones who be resurrected are the ones who are dead in Christ. Now, if you just, just, just a little bit of trivia to keep you focused. If you go back to what we said in Matthew, and Matthew said, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward according to his works meaning he will reward us according to the choices that we have made at that time when he comes, right? Um, if Paul is also saying that the dead in Christ will rise first, it means that before Jesus comes, he must know who are the dead in Christ. Is that a reasonable conclusion? And that is what is important to appreciate that 1844, the end of the 2300 days prophecy, signal the start of what we like to call the pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment, the pre-advent judgment, a judgment process that started before Christ comes. It is the atypical day of atonement of the heavenly sanctuary, which the Jews experience in it. And in that, God is going to spend, Jesus is going to spend time going through the lives of everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ and determine whether or not they are worthy of um, being resurrected when he comes the first time or being caught up with him in heaven. What is being worthy? Well, that's simple. You don't have to do anything. You only have to accept Christ and allow his righteousness to cover us so that when he examines our lives, he may see us having committed whatever wrongs and evils, but he will also see that his blood on Calvary, his, his sacrifice for us, stands in our place and we are no longer um, entitled to death but we are experiencing life through Jesus Christ because he takes control of our life and that is powerful all right because it really says that God is doing a little bit of judgment before he comes and then when he those who remain after now is the ones he now need to finish off our judgment with. Paul of Fuda says we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, meaning our bodies, right? And in case they want to show, he then went on to say, and this mortal, mortal, sorry, shall put on immortality. We have a mortal body now that out of the garden of Eden degradates and gets to the point where we die, Paul is saying that that will change. And then he says, then we who are alive and remain, the first Thessalonians again, shall be caught up. So he talks about the, those who are dead in Christ will be resurrected first, and then he says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So Paul is being very clear. This is not cryptic language. This is not symbolic language. This is not revelation. This is Thessalonians and Corinthians. Paul in writing to the church because the, the Thessalonians were overcome with grief when people died, etc. And Paul began his salutation by saying, I would not have you ignorant about what is happening to the dead. People are dead, yes, but at some point in time, Christ will come. And when he comes, those who are faithful, if you die, you will be resurrected first. And then we who are alive, because Paul anticipated, amazing, isn't it, that Christ would come in his lifetime. But it didn't happen. No problem. You and I could anticipate Christ will come in our life. And even if we die like Paul, we would say to the, the generation who comes after us that they who are alive, will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, providing, of course, you are faithful, you've accepted Christ's offer of forgiveness and a sacrifice in our lives, and that we will reign with him. That's what, that's what thus we shall always be with the Lord. It means we will reign in his kingdom forever. 
because the kingdom he's coming to establish is a forever kingdom. I hope everybody is comfortable with that so far. Further, some further details in John chapter 5. He says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So John is making a clear statement here that there would be two resurrections, a resurrection to life and a resurrection of damnation. That is a kind of cryptic thing, but we will have to clarify that as we go forward. Everybody okay with that? So that is our summary, if you will, of what the Bible says about the second coming up to this point, right? And I just picked a few texts because I wanted to establish this dual nature of two resurrections, because Revelation 20 is going to clarify this for us as we go forward. All right, Revelation 20 is also going to further expand on this concept that Paul told us about the dead in Christ rising first, and then we who are alive are changed um, and walk to meet with Christ in heaven. So, so that is where we are heading now as we go forward. Everybody okay? Any questions? All right. Good. Let's keep going then. Um, so let's talk about the millennium and the end of sin. And, and I want I deliberately tie that together. Um, I picked that anyway from a, another set of presentations, but the, the fact that they tie them together to me is extremely important, right? So let's talk about the outline of Revelation chapter 20. And maybe we talk about the outline of Revelation chapter 20 all the way to chapter 21, verses 1 to 8. And, and really, um, like these chapter divisions are semantics, right? In truth and in fact, one could argue that Revelation chapters 19 to 22 really form one sort of piece together. But for the purposes of, of time management, we're going to take them in bits and pieces. So what I, what I call part one today and our introduction is really an introduction and a part one that will cover Revelation 20 to 21 verses 1 to 8. So when we get to next week, we will pursue this a bit further and we'll see how far we go. So verse 1, and I, I, I talk this even though we haven't read the chapters yet, but we will read as we go along. And in your own reading, this is sort of a guide to help you appreciate where things are at, right? So verse 1 says, if you will, that... Verse 1 is a sort of introductory scene. Everybody okay with that? It's an introductory scene. It, it's an introduction, if you will, to what is coming up in this chapter. Verses 2 and 3 will introduce... Now, you know, the Bible um, doesn't try to prove itself. Eh? I, I want to make that very clear. I know a lot of people like to use it but the, the Bible to win arguments. And say, well, let's go and let me tell you what the Bible says. When we started off Genesis, notice how Genesis started. It just says in the beginning, God created. It introduced God, and it introduced God at the beginning. It didn't try to explain it. It didn't try to say, well, how God came into being. It didn't try to say, well, why he created it. They just simply laid that out on us, right? And then we got into the creation story, and we got into the history of the world, and somewhere um, in that first Genesis encounter, we were told that there was a serpent in a garden. And that's when we first heard about Lucifer, right? Um, we, didn't, we didn't have all the details we got in Revelation chapter 12 later on. So I'm saying to you that when we get to Revelation chapter 20, this is not um, a logical presentation where God is trying to prove anything to you. He's saying to you that the devil would be born for a thousand years. That is when we are introduced to this term, 1,000 years, and we will talk about that in a little bit. So that is what is introduced in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, and we'll talk about the devil being born in a bottomless pit for 1,000 years. We'll come back to that detail in a while. Verses 4 to 6 talks about the saints will reign with Christ for 1,000 years. So there are two contrasting aspects of this 1,000 years. In the first aspect, the devil is bound with chains, actually. It uses the word chains for 1,000 years. 
And then in the second aspect, the saints. Who are the saints? You and I. The followers of Jesus Christ. Not any special people with powers and stuff. The saints, that's how the Bible used the word saints. In, in, in the book of Psalms, um, David talks about saints and he talks about sinful people as being saints, right? Um, normal human beings. So, so it's only later on that word saint took on this connotation to mean people with special um, piousness and special fidelity. That was, that was not the original intent in the scriptures, all right? So I think it's important just to appreciate that. So the saints will reign with Christ, the people will reign with Christ for 1,000 years. That's verses 4 and 6. And by new, my new, in case you jump to your Bible and start to read all this and you get confused, Revelation 20 is a literal, a literary masterpiece, eh? because it, 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 it follows a little bit of chronological order, but then it goes back and forth, if you will, into the events and provides some illumination as we go along. So it doesn't necessarily flow naturally as you would if you're reading a novel or a bit of fiction, all right? Verses 7 to 10 tells us about a satanic rebellion that will be crushed. I use the word crush here, but that is concluded, punto final, come to an end, because the way it's presented suggests it's going to be really, really final, all right? Um, verses 11 to 15 tells us about the great white throne of judgment. So in all of this potpourri here, there's something going on around judgment. Um, but we have to deal with this thousand years and figure out how that fits into it. And then Revelation 21, 1 to 8, talks about a new heaven and a new earth. That is where we are. This is what we've done. Everything we've talked about before is leading up to this. For at last, at last, Revelation is going to tell us in very clear terms, what are the sequence of things that will be going on when Christ comes a second time? We get in a bit more detail than we have before. We've figured out a few things. We've figured out that when Christ comes, it's just at a point in time when the world seems to be assembled against his people and they want to make one final push to destroy them, but God delivers them through his second coming. His second coming will be accompanied with great climatic events and cataclysmic events. The, the heavens will roll back, um, thunder, lightning. There would be mountains falling and volcanic activity, all right? Um, people will die. The righteous will um, be changed if they are alive and go up to meet him in the air. And the, the righteous dead will be resurrected. But there's a mention of a resurrection of the wicked, we'll see when that occurs, whether that occurs at that point in time or sometime after. And now we are introducing another component into this, which is a thousand years. Now that is worrying because we have to ask ourselves, how is it that we have to wait for a thousand years for all this to happen? Or is this part of his second coming? If it's a thousand years, that's a long time. Um, and how does all that fit? And that is the level of detail we need to sort out as we go forward. So let's deal with the first one, which is desolation and the introductory scene, right? So Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Now that word then is actually a follow-on from the end of Revelation chapter 90. Revelation chapter 19, as it came to an end, we were told, and I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth, the union of church and state, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sit upon a horse. So they have gathered, if you will, to destroy God's people, but Christ puts in his appearance. As Christ puts in his appearance, he is seen as a foreign entity entering into the space of earth, there's an attempt to marshal the universal forces of earth to fight this entity. This is nothing new. You've seen this repeated in movie plots all the time throughout our, our century. And that is because the devil is trying to downplay the significance of this, as my view anyway. Um, so they gather to, to fight him that sat on a horse and against his army. Verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast 
and them that worship his image. So he's saying that when he says taken, it kind of says he's captured. All right? Um, it comes to an end, and it includes everybody who's a part of this whole movement. These boats, so he's talking about the beasts, the false prophet who had wrought all the miracles. These boats are cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. If they are cast into a lake of fire alive, obviously they're going to die, right? So that is an that is a, a end game, as hellfire. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of the mouth of, the, of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, this is cryptic, because when we looked at this, I told you that this remnant here is not the remnant church of God, but it's going back to verse 20 and saying, after he cast the beasts and the false prophet who wrought miracles into the lake of fire, the, 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 the others, those who remained, they died. The fact that volunteers are wanting to come to their bodies, they're using that imagery from the Old Testament time to say that they will die. So, so that, is how verse, that is how Revelation 19 concludes. And verse 20 then says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. So it is saying that there is a point of, of desolation that has been introduced in Revelation chapter 19, it ends by suggesting that Christ has come on his horse. He has taken the, the main perpetrators, the beast and the false prophet. He's cast them into a lake of fire. So they, they well see in drama and everybody else has died. But we remember that we were told before that the dead in Christ will rise first and that they who are alive will be taken up, will be changed and taken up to meet him, corruptible, turns incorruptible, etc. So having understood that, you begin to appreciate that if, and just, just bear with me, I know we have to still figure it out, but if the righteous or the faithful are changed and taken up with Christ and they go up into heaven and that the beast is cast into a lake of fire, meaning destroyed, and the, the false prophet destroyed, so earth's kingdoms are destroyed and the remaining people who have not been faithful are also destroyed and they are like they, they are like bodies thrown on the ground waiting for volunteers to grab them. Then you begin to appreciate that earth must clearly be in some sort of desolate stage. Is that okay? So this is the timing of Revelation chapter 20. It is at the second coming of Christ. His, his brilliance and his brightness has caused people to die upon the face of the earth. They have fallen down in that stupor, if you will, the, the, the righteous dead are resurrected. They have become immortal and they have been taken up into the clouds with him. The righteous living have been changed and taken up in the clouds with him. So what remains is a desolate earth. And then he says, I see an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So that is what is introduced. Now, Really, that, that word bottomless pit, if you watch out the slides, the word bottomless pit that is used here in verse 1 is a word that we encountered before when we're dealing with the seven trumpets. And we talked about the sixth trumpet with the, um, with the, the beast who came up from the bottomless pit. And we talked about atheism and the, the, um, the French Revolution and how it engulfed the world. We talked about the fact that they used a very special Greek word called abus, which is really where we get our word abyss from, which is a, a, a dark place, a place without form and void. It is actually the same word that is used in the original uh, manuscript for Genesis when it says the earth was without form and void. It was dark, void. So, so, so it is basically saying that in, Genesis, in Revelation 20, after... Christ has come, and, and I'm not saying he's reached back up into heaven as yet, but I'm saying after all those other things have happened, we see an angel appearing with a key to what looks as a desolate place. That, that abyss, that bottomless pit is the earth, because the earth is now back to what looks like its original state without form and void. It seems very desolate and a dark place. The kingdom of the earth have been destroyed. 
by fire and by brightness of Christ's coming and in rocks and mountains falling. The righteous have been um, taken up, if you will, in the clouds of Christ. And so what remains then is a desolate place, all right? And he sees an angel coming down with a key. Obviously, it's not a, a real literal key. So it means that there's an angel who is now in charge of all of this. But interestingly, the angel has a chain in his hands. And we need to figure out what that chain is meant for. Just some quick points to note. Um, after the beasts and the false prophets are destroyed, the rest of Satan's followers will die and there will be no survivors. That is what Revelation 19, 21 told us, right? When I we read the part about their bodies are laid out for the fowls of the air. It is symbolic language to say everybody is dead. I want us to just get those points clear in our head, right? The earth becomes desolate. Since the righteous are sent to be with the Lord and the wicked are destroyed at his appearing, the earth stands at a time without human inhabitants. Everybody okay with that? Now remember the beasts and the false prophets are also earthly governments and earthly kingdoms. So they are also destroyed. So who remains? Think about that. If Christ has taken a righteous dead and a righteous living up into the sky, and the wicked are, um, or, the, or the unfaithful are dead, um, and all the nations of the world are destroyed, who is alive? Who is alive? You could answer that question. I know in your own mind, you know, the only one who's alive at that point in time is the devil and his angels. He's still to be dealt with. So it is in that context that John says, I then see an angel coming down from heaven and he's approaching this abyss, this desolate place, this earth that looks as if it is, it is nothing is, could survive, nothing is going to happen to it. It looks dismal, a far cry from itself. But he has a chain in his hand and a key, meaning he is, he is the, he using terms like a, a jailkeeper. He's the one who seems to be able to manage the space. And then there's another thing that says, battered by the seven deadly plagues that immediately preceded Christ's coming and covered with the bodies of the wicked, the earth is a scene of utter desolation. Where do you write to that? Where do you write to that? Now, we are not surprised at this, eh? because when we looked at Jeremiah, Jeremiah told us in his prophecies some important things. I read a few of them before. But let me repeat a few he said. He says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. This couldn't be back in the Genesis time. He's talking about forward, because Jeremiah is prophesying. And the heavens, they had no light. So it's a dark place. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. These are powerful Old Testament prophecies that are now coming to fruition. I beheld, and indeed there was no man and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all the cities were broken down. And the presence, but at the presence of the Lord, that is, what, that is how it's, I, let me just read that properly. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Is that all right? So it's basically suggesting that um, the Old Testament prophet was talking about this very time when the earth seems to be desolate. There is a, and I, I'm not talking, I can't tell you how long that time is. All I'm saying is that as the thing, as the sequence occurs, Christ comes, they try to fight him, he destroys the kingdoms of this world, the Christian church the, the um, political kingdoms that are signed in the Christian church, all the people who are supporting that, the remnant of that, they are also put to death. Everybody is dead. The righteous who are dead are, because they were judged before in the pre-advent judgment, they are now taken up, resurrected and taken up with Christ, raised first according to Paul. The living who are righteous are changing and drinking of an eye, they are taken up. What remains then is a desolate earth very similar and identical to the prophecies of Jeremiah. And I ask you, who remains in that state? And that is where we go to Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. So he continues, 
And he says, he, who is he he here? The angel who came down with the key to the bottomless pit and the chain in the hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, because he has not been dealt with. Revelation 19, 17 to 21 told us that the beast and the false prophet, so the beast and the nations of the earth that joined together to form that union, they are destroyed, lake of fire. So they go down into death, right? They, they look like they die one time. The whole, the whole nation's kingdoms are destroyed. Jeremiah tells us that place looks dark and desolate, no light in the sky, it looks very bad. But the angel who has come down, he, he has a key, meaning that he has control, the jail, the, the, the jail master um, who has the keys. He is the one who has control of the jailhouse. He can say when to open, when to close. So that is the imagery here. He's coming along with the key, meaning he is in control and he has a chain. If he has a chain, it means he comes to bong something. So we don't have to guess because verse 2 says, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. Verse 20, it continues and says, so that he would he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Powerful stuff. Let's just, just read it again slowly. It says, he, and I'm saying that he is the angel, referred to in verse one. He laid hold of the dragon. No, no ambiguity who the dragon is because he explains it. That serpent of old, same one in the garden of Eden, who is the devil, Lucifer, and Satan, in case he wasn't too sure, and bound him for a thousand years. So, you can ask yourself, what does bound him mean? Is he tying him up with a chain, presumably, because he's coming with a chain? So, is it that you're physically holding the devil and tying him up and cast him into the bottomless pit? Which is, what is the bottomless pit at this point in time? The earth, the earth without people on it, the earth without kingdoms and cities, because it's all been burnt in a lake of fire and being destroyed. God is going to destroy this earth. But the earth is kind of still an entity, if you will, but it's a dark, dismal place, according to Jeremiah and the prophecies. And so the devil, with his chains, if you will, is cast upon this, this dismal earth, if you will. What are his chains? Well, maybe we could think about that, because it says here, um, and set a seal on him, so that he could not deceive the nations no more, Till a thousand years were finished. Just stop there. Maybe that is a chain. Because if the devil's job is to deceive people, because he's already lost to Jesus, he lost to the cross of Calvary. So if there is nobody for him to tempt, and there is, you know, parents, parents punish children by putting them in a corner and them keep still. I mean, you tell a child that and it's like, they just cuss them because keep still, and, and they don't know how to get away from that, right? So in a way, when you tell a devil whose only job is to convince others to join him in his debt and his loss, and there are no others to convince, there are no others to motivate, there are no others to activate to persecute people, there are no others to, to, to form nations and create an image of the beast. There's nothing like that. And he's now just sitting upon the earth and he has nothing to do. Effectively, he is bound and tied and cannot do anything. That is fundamentally what we are saying here. He is bound. He is unable to carry out any activity. Is that okay? And that is what we are establishing. But after these things, and it seems to be a time limit, a time limit of a thousand years, and it says after the thousand years, he will be released for a little while. If he is bound, by the fact that there is no people, then release could only be that people return. If people are returning, it means that there is another resurrection. But the only people who are yet to be resurrected are the unfaithful who did not believe in Christ and were dead when he came that second time. So we need to think about that because we're not going beyond chapter 2 today. But I mean verse 2 today. But when we get to next week, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Some key points. This millennium merely means a thousand years, right? It, it, it's really a, a double barrel word, if you will, that we've come together to call millennium, just like century. 
um, and it means centuries are to 100, um, and so milli is a thousand, and then we tie it with annum, which is um, for meaning years, we get millennium, a thousand years. So clearly, when it says that Satan is bound in chains of darkness on a desolate earth for a thousand years, it is really speaking to the fact that he is upon the earth with nobody to tempt. Are we okay with that? I know you like little Satan depiction I have here, but let me not get caught up in remembering that Satan looks like an angel of light, right? So let me not forget that. All right, so, so we're just using this for illustrative purposes anyway. But the point I want to make is that when it says he's bound um, on, the, on the earth, it's because he's now on the earth for a thousand years without anybody to tempt. Is there anything to suggest that this is symbolic language? No. The, the, the whole context in which it's presented suggests that, yes, the bond is, con is, is symbolic. Yes, the chains are symbolic. You can't see chains holding on the Lucifer. But how can you hold Lucifer? Well, we already told in Revelation 12 that he was cast down upon the earth. But when he was cast down on the earth after Christ died and was resurrected and went into heaven, and then he could no longer roam anywhere else in the universe but had to stay upon the earth. When he was cast down upon the earth, he then said, look, I in a short time. What does that mean? The devil has a short time. So he goes about making war with the woman and the remnant of a seed. Why does he think he has a short time? Because he knows that 2,000 years is nothing in the sight of God, and that is a little bit of time. And so he focuses his energy, already condemned, already given a death sentence, he focuses energy on carrying friends with him. You know, you'll be able to say friends as carry, but they don't bring you back. He's carrying friends with him. I had a story long time used to say that when the fox lost his tail, he told all the other animals how, you know, how free I run these days without a tail. Why don't cut off yours too, you know? So he, he is carrying more people with him, if you will. And therefore, he is, he is very busy. However, when Christ comes, physical, burst the clouds of glory, spectacularly, like lightning from the east to the west, visibly upon a, a cloud, which is a retinue of angels and an army of angels, and he comes upon the earth. People die, those who are unfaithful. The, the nations of the earth and the physical um, representations of that are destroyed in a lake of fire. Right? And all of that is destroyed. The righteous go into heaven. Whether they were dead in Christ or they were alive and changed, they go up with Christ into heaven. And he is now in this desolate place. And the language tells us he's here for a thousand years. There's nothing to suggest that a thousand years is figurative. So for now, we accept, as indeed all other commentators, that this is a literal thousand year period. So he is on the earth for a thousand years with nobody to tempt. That is phenomenal. That is virtually putting him in jail and, bong in, bong, and binding him, if you will, upon the earth. He's bound forever. All right? So we begin to ask ourselves as we close off, what are the sequence of events? And let's just go through them again, right? Jesus' second coming is the start of the thousand-year period. Let's accept that, Yes. This is the, 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 the starting point of the thousand-year period, Jesus' second coming. So the faithful who are alive are transformed and caught up in heaven, heaven with him. Paul told us that in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, told us again in Corinthians, corruptible into indoor, corruptible. And then when we looked at um, Revelation 19, we were told that they are caught up, right? But we'll talk about that even more in chapter 20. But up to this point, the faithful who are alive are transformed and caught up with him. The dead in Christ are raised to life with him. Everybody okay with that so far? The unfaithful, I don't like to call them wicked. The unfaithful who are alive, they die. Of course, the unfaithful who are dead remain dead. Let's be clear about that. They are not resurrected, right? So the unfaithful who are dead remain dead. The unfaithful who are alive um, die. All right? Earth becomes a bottomless pit. 
it becomes desolate, right? So earth becomes a desolate place. That's the, that's the other sequence now, because there's nobody here. And then the other thing is, in that desolate earth, Satan is bound for a thousand years. So you could argue that the next part of the story is what happens during that thousand years, and then what happens after the thousand years. Because we need to understand what that means when it says he was released for a little while. What does that mean? Everybody okay with that? Just go over the sequence again to make sure we're all on the same page. Christ comes. The faithful who are alive are transformed and caught up with him. The dead in Christ are raised to life with him. Unfaithful who are alive die. Earth becomes a desolate place, if you will, a bottomless pit. And Satan is born on earth for a thousand years. There's a little bit of a... Um, a uh, 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 subplot or sub-story inside of here that those of you who have read Ellen White extensively, she would tell you that the, when it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, that when Christ comes, every eye shall see him, including they that pierced him. They that pierced him are dead. So they would see Christ, for them to see Christ when he comes, there is a partial resurrection of them, if you will, so that that prophecy is fulfilled. But that is something that we could pick up at another time. I just want to keep this sequence clear in your head that what we have here are the faithful who are alive, transform and caught up with him. The dead in Christ are raised to life with him. Unfaithful who are alive die. This is the, there's an implication here that the unfaithful who are dead remain dead. Earth becomes a bottomless pit, an abyss, a place abyss without form and void. It becomes a dark place, right? As per Jeremiah, go back and read those verses in Jeremiah chapter 4. They are powerful representations of this period. And so the devil is now um, isolated to a place already cast down since Revelation chapter 12 and can't go anywhere else in the universe. So he's now in a, in a, in a chained environment. He is bound not physically by chains, but he's bound by circumstances, unable to tempt anyone. He's really come to an end. So you could argue that we have covered the introductory scene and Satan being bound for a thousand years. We will finish the rest of this next week. So next week, we will cover the other three sections, if you will, as part two. And then in part three, we look at the new heaven and the new earth. Some closing thoughts. At the second advent, the first resurrection takes place. The righteous and the blessed and holy are raised, right? That is something we'll come to when we get to chapter verse 6 of Revelation chapter 20. So that is what happens, right? This is just reinforcing that sequence we just talked about. After the resurrection of the righteous dead, they and the living saints are caught up to meet with the Lord in the air. As what Paul told us in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Christ does not establish, this is important, Christ does not establish his kingdom of glory on the earth at this time. He does that at the end of the millennium. So I'm giving you a hint. Because what we looked at in our sequence is that Christ takes the, um, the, the righteous with him. And therefore there is a period where for that thousand years, the righteous saints of God are reigning with Christ in heaven. Not upon this earth, but in heaven. Now, that is an important detail because if you have been a regular Christian and you keep repeating um, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in Christ. Believe also in my Father's house. There are many mansions. I would go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. You know that Christ had promised to prepare a place in heaven for his people. But is heaven the final kingdom destination for this world? And the answer is no, because we have to, we have to deal with that. But our, our argument and our, our, um, our, our hypothesis, our, our position at this time is that Christ will reestablish a kingdom on this earth, a new earth, and that it will be made new and that we will live here forever, right? So the, the heavenly um, period is a short period for about a thousand years. And we talk about it in detail 
and we come back next week. So those are my comments. Again, we start a bit late, but I think we covered the main material. And of course, I will spend some time going over this again next week. Maybe not with the first two sections, but a lot of what we covered here. And we move back into, um, into the scenes we name it Christ. You can now go and read the rest of Revelation chapter 20. Now that you have this outline, I think it will make for good reading. And hopefully we will appreciate all that is said here today. Any questions or comments? I haven't seen anything in either YouTube or, um, or Zoom. So we can conclude today. So thank you all. Really appreciate. Oh, I saw a hard part here. Yes, it's a Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, you said that mm -hmm. the the faithful uh, yes. those who are followers of christ will be um taken up with him and those who are unfaithful or who don't believe in 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 in, in christ will remain dead yes and even the ones who pierced him but mm -hmm. won't the ones who pierced him non-believers so how are they going to see him as well <laughs> yeah well i um I took a chance introducing that to some part because it's a little bit of a um, a little bit of a detail that sometimes can take away from the bigger message. So I, if you notice, I preface that by saying those who are regular readers of Ellen White. So in, in Great Controversy, for instance, Ellen White talks a little bit about that because she is attempting to explain, and she's not alone, eh? a lot of the older um, biblical commentators have the same views. So it, that verse in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, that says, Christ shall burst the clouds of glory, and every eye shall see him, including they that pierce him. It's a, it's a troubling verse, because if you follow the sequence, as you just said, you would think that they would only see him sometime later. But his statement was clear that they would see him when he comes and he bursts the clouds of glory. Um, he also talked about that when he was on the earth, and he suggested that the um, that those who were crucified, he said, the next time you shall see the Son of Man, you shall see him in his, in his glory. That's what we read in Matthew when we looked at that, right? So the, the conclusion from a lot of the theologians around that, and including Ellen White in, in her writings in Great Controversy, is that there is what we call a partial resurrection, so that they are resurrected for the fulfillment of that prophecy, but then they go back into their dead state, waiting for the end of the thousand years. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a um, conclusion, a little bit of deduction out of the way the text is written and attempting to fit that reality into the sequence that we have been clearly described. So that, that is why I said it. I said it only to be, to be um, complete in my representation of what is in the Bible. But I, I can't argue with you that I have, um, I could cross-reference that to anything else in the scriptures. Really, this is the way um, a lot of commentators, and Ellen White in particular, who has been very lucid on this, have, have, really, um, have really interpreted how that requirement to see Christ, those who pierced him to see him, is a fulfillment of the prophecy when it said, yeah, no, you you killing me now, but one day you would see me in the clouds of glory. And if they, of course, I agree with you, they are unbelievers and they are not people who are faithful, then it means that they will return to the desolate until the other, after the thousand years, when those who were unfaithful and were in the desolate earth, their resurrection is going to come then. So that is why it's referred to as a partial resurrection. I hope I'm confusing okay. more. Thank you. <laughs> Did I confuse you more or are you okay? You confused me more, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll give it, I'll, I'll see if I find some readers that answer that to you separately. Okay, thank you. All right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anybody? I'm not surprised I get a question eh, because I took a chance in, um, in putting it in, but. Any other questions, anyone? All right.
Well, I think we've covered our main topic for today, albeit at a little bit of speed, but we got it out anyway. So we will return to this next week. Um, this is exciting. I think you should really spend some time this week just reading Revelation 20 a few times to make sure you understand every aspect of it. And then we get back to that again as we go forward. All right. So let's um let's conclude that with a prayer. Oh, Deborah has a question. Yes, Deborah. And I'll mute. Yes. Um, and there was also a partial resurrection when Jesus went into heaven also. Yes, yes. So that, that was what I was going to find for her to send. So yes, um, just for the sake of everyone, remember that when Christ, when Christ was resurrected on that Sunday morning, the disciples reported that the graves were open and that people saw those who were dead walking in the streets and that they went up into heaven with him. As a matter of fact, when we were talking about the 24 elders um, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, I talked about that because sometimes there is this confusion in some of the writings that seems to think that the 24 elders were those people. But we are very clear that the 24 elders are celestial beings and they were part of the heavenly um, home, if you will, in the heavenly system. So there is, there is um, precedent, if you will, for that sort of partial resurrection, which is what has been covered. But I just want to keep the big picture in your mind in terms of the sequence. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Anybody? All right, let's go ahead, Supra. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for your word and for the details you have given to us in your word. We pray that you would lead us according to your divine will, dear Lord, and that you would continue to really open up our hearts to understand the importance of your word and your message. Draw us ever closer to you. Thank you for this powerful truth that you revealed to us today. These are the mercies we do ask in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.